Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 16 on authentication. This is the second half of our uh, security topic. Last time we began with security by talking about encryption and anonymity. At the beginning of that lecture we mentioned that the goals of network security in general could be described as confidentiality, reliability, integrity, authentication, and anonymity. Uh, last time we talked about confidentiality and anonymity which were solved through different um, means of encryption. Today we're going to address authentication, which also um, is an encryption related topic. The reason we talk so much about security in this class is that routers and other participants on the network, uh, perhaps, perhaps your neighbors on the network, can't be trusted. And they can, you know, you, so you have to assume that when you send a packet on the internet that at least someone, the others can see that, that, that those packets. Um, Encryption allows us to encrypt to protect the contents of the data from being read by anyone except the endpoint, the receiver of the message. AES is the standard symmetric key encryption algorithm. This requires that both parties have a shared session key. That requirement is kind of difficult to uh, achieve on its own, and we introduced public key cryptography, in particular the RSA algorithm, to solve this problem, to allow two uh, parties, two, two hosts on the internet, to securely communicate with each other without having ahead of time agreed upon a shared key. And that's done by using public key, private key pairs. The public key is something you can give to anyone, and, that's, um, and, and those receivers of that public key can encrypt data using it to send to you uh, that only you can decrypt using the private key. We'll see in this lecture that same idea can be applied uh, for, to digital signatures to achieve authentication. Um, we also talked last time about onion routing or mixed networks, which are overlay networks on the internet that use a, a bunch of uh, TCP connections across the internet to relay the message to get to the final destination indirectly, uh, by, and it wraps the data in layers of, of public key encryption to uh, prevent any one of the receivers from knowing uh, what the contents are and also from to prevent them from knowing who the uh, sender was yeah, and who the, who the receiver is. This, uh, this allows data to be delivered to a end host without anyone knowing where it came from and also allows a service to be advertised without anyone knowing where that service is, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, but those are important uh, factors in uh, modern networking, although they're not widely used in the public services that you use every day, uh, those technologies have been around for and become popular over the past 10 years or so. Okay, so today we're talking about authentication. What I mean by authentication is that we want to verify the identity of the person or host that you're communicating with. Um, again, if you send a message to a certain IP address, you hope that the network delivers it to that IP address, but you can't really be sure of that because, again, we're assuming that the routers and um, other hosts in the network are not necessarily trustworthy. I mean, as a whole, on the whole, we expect them to be trustworthy, but any one router could be acting maliciously or any small set of routers generally could be acting malici maliciously. Now, we want authentication primarily to protect confidentiality, which is uh, to say keeping your message is secret. Why is it that we need to identify, to verify the identity of the person you're communicating with to keep your messages secret. Please stop and think about that. Just at a basic level. Well, we, we want to verify that the party that we're communicating with, um, not just that that's the only person who can read my message, but that that is the person I intended to be the one person who can read my message. We'll see uh, that Man in the middle attacks are ways that we subvert confidentiality if authentication is not protected. In other words, if we connect to the wrong person, the wrong host, instead of the host we we're trying to connect to, then somehow things can go wrong, right? Then we start exchanging keys with that that uh, wrong person, that that man in the middle in the in the security parlance, and um, our data gets gets leaked to the wrong person. Okay, so man in the middle attack, it's abbreviated MITM, uh, is a major flaw in the scheme I presented last time. Last time I showed you how public key encryption can be used to establish a secure connection. Well, we need more than just what I showed you last time to really get secure communication on the internet. And um, 
because because the, what I described last time is susceptible to a man in the middle attack. Uh, without introducing some new concepts, some new techniques, um, we we can't be sure that the machine we connect to is actually the one we intended to connect to. So the messages we get from the other side might not be authentic. And um, a man in the middle it can, is a, a router in general in between in the middle of the conversation that advertises a false public key instead of the public key of the, the person we're trying to talk to kind of does a substitution and that allows uh, the man in the middle to violate to see the contents of the message and to change messages and all that stuff um, this is abstract at first but I have a, a, an example uh, to illustrate this coming right up all right so in the middle we have this evil router that is the man in the middle with the little devil horns okay so this is kind of using the same kind of public key handshake that we talked about last time that in general is used for uh, encrypted communication to ensure confidentiality. We'll see how the man in the middle uh, uh, subverts that scheme. So we have A and G are trying to communicate. The, the client A has its own public key and it advertises that to G so that G can encrypt its its data back to A. And, and this, well, the same things that happen in, in reverse, right? But when this evil router is involved, it, of course, is handling the, the data sent by A before it's delivered to G. And what it can do is actually substitute the public key that was advertised. So, so far, nothing's encrypted because A and G don't know, don't have a shared key of any kind. They don't know um, what the other side's public key is, or they don't have a shared uh, session key, uh, you know, a symmetric key or anything. So they have to, sh the, the, the first step is to share public keys. What this evil router, this man in the middle has done is changed the public key to be its own public key. So A said its public key was this uh, public key A. Uh, the man in the middle rewrote the message to actually advertise a different public key M, which of course it has the, the private key for, okay? And you'll see, uh, if you think ahead, you'll, you'll see how that causes a problem. But basically the same thing happens in reverse. So G advertises its public key, this public key G. The man in the middle again uh, tampers with the message before delivering it to A, and it substitutes its own public key in that advertisement. Okay, so now at this point, um, at this point, both A and G think the other person's public key is this this public key M. In other words, they, they're going to use the public key that the evil router uh, has the ability to decrypt. And they won't really know what's, that that's happening. So after this exchange happens, A sends a message. So this was this was this message, like the same example as last time. The message was, I feel pretty. It was encrypted using the public key that was received. That produces this, this purple encrypted message. The evil router can decrypt it because it has the secret, uh, the secret private key associated with that public key M. And importantly, it can re-encrypt it using public key G. Like in step in this green step up here, G told the man in the middle what the correct public key was, and it can kind of rewrite the message, the re-encrypt the message and deliver it to G, so that when G gets the message, of course, it'll also be able to decrypt it and um, see what was sent. And it doesn't know anything bad happened. It doesn't know that in fact the message was originally encrypted with a different key and it was re-encrypted and that someone in the middle read the message, okay? G can give a response. The response, like last time, was do you? Uh, in this case, the evil router, again, using the same uh, key, can reveal that response and also can rewrite it. This is, uh, so this is a, an even more advanced attack. So it's it saw what was sent, it rewrote it to a different response. It, in, in response, it re encrypts it using uh, the public key for A. It sends that back to A. So now two things have gone wrong. The man in the middle has read the messages that were sent by both sides. It also has altered one of the messages so that A thinks G you know, has a different response than, was, than it was originally generated. All right. That is essentially a man in the middle attack. So, um, and again, the reason that was possible was because uh, one of the routers was malicious it could also be you could use dns poisoning instead to do this attack like if you have control of a dns resolver and you for example 
change it to advertise a different IP address for let's say uh, gmail.com then the clients that, that make that DNS request will be directed to your IP address instead of gmail.com and then you can then do relay the, the response the request to G, to the real gmail IP address and like act as a man in the middle there for, for that connection um, you also could use ARP poisoning to uh, claim an IP address in, in, local, in a local network and do that kind of uh, man in the middle attack but the, the example I showed in the pictures was um, the simplest one to understand is just assuming one of the routers is malicious. But keep in mind that even if you do trust the routers, there are other ways that um, that malicious actors can attract traffic that, that they're not supposed to get. Okay, and we, we were hoping that the encryption would have would have um, prevented, prevented that from being a problem, even though the, the routers are not trusted, or the traffic might be delivered to the wrong person. Theoretically, if it's encrypted, that won't be, wouldn't be an issue. But because the public key exchange, um, if the if the if that man in the middle is involved in the public key exchange at the beginning of the conversation, then that would actually cause the encryption to be incorrect as well, and the encrypted messages to be re uh, readable by that man in the middle. All right. So to avoid man in the middle attacks, the first solution maybe is to avoid public key cryptography in the first place and to use symmetric key encryption with pre-shared keys. So this is going back to the idea of like, you know, calling the person on the telephone or some other, having some other real world, non-internet based communication mechanism where you exchange uh, keys, symmetric keys. Um, that's that certainly is strong, but it's not convenient and it doesn't allow you to work with, uh, to connect to strangers. Now, the re real solution we use is to somehow ensure the public key that we get really belongs to the endpoint and not some man in the middle. So we have to have some authentication of the public key. And this is done using digital signatures. And the, it, it's, it's a little bit complicated and we'll, we'll spend most of this lecture talking about how that works. Okay, so a digital signature is a way to uh, produce a public document so you have a document that's not encrypted that makes some claim or has a message. So in this particular case, the problem we're trying to solve is to um, verify that a certain domain has a particular public key. Like google.com has this particular public key that everyone should be using. So if a man in the middle advertises a different public key for that website, then the clients should recognize that it's fake and reject it because they have some, they have some, uh, they have a certificate which is, that proves that the correct public key for Google is some different public key. Okay, so again, we want to produce a public document has some information, some some claim or message, and anyone who gets that document, that's that uh, certificate, can verify that the author can verify the author of the document that it, that the document was produced by a particular person, particular entity, and not by someone else. In other words, that it, this document was not forged by someone else. And that, you know, in the real world, of, um, especially in the old days, we had ink signatures, like this John Hancock up here, which were supposed to be a way to um, certify a document. So if you write a letter or, 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 or a contract, and at the bottom you, your signature appears in ink, the idea is that the person looking at it would look at the signature and say, oh, that looks, that looks like John Hancock's signature because I, I have seen John Hancock's sign things before. I've ha I have other documents from that person. I know that his signature looks like that. And it would be difficult for someone else to replicate that exact signature. Of course, it's not a perfect system. We know that you can forge a signature if you're really careful and good at um, writing and calligraphy. But that, that the same basic idea is used here for digital signatures. But of course, we have stronger We'll see how there are stronger guarantees than just like, you know, this looks right. Uh, we have cryptographic guarantees um, that are based on, on algorithms and, and difficulty of solving uh, certain problems. Okay, so the existence of the signature on the document proves something. So if you get a contract that's signed by someone, you don't have, it doesn't, you don't have to have been there when the signature happened. You don't have to have witnessed John Hancock putting his signature on the document. The fact that you have the document in front of you with a signature um, proves to you somehow that that particular person saw the document and agreed to put their name on it. And therefore, they're like um, certifying it, right? So it doesn't matter who gave us a copy of the document. Uh, 
and um, we know that it was generated by a certain person. Now, what's different about digital signatures is that uh, digital signatures are unique to the particular document. So with a ink signature in the, in the old days, you could maybe like cut out that ink, that, that uh, signature and put it on a different document and photocopy it. And it would look like uh, a valid signature. You know, you probably could do this with your recommendation letters for college or something like that. If you want to rewrite it, if you had a copy, um, the, the, like that, that, that way of authenticating documents is not, is very weak with digital signatures. It's actually the signature is different for each document and the signature like kind of has to be generated from a particular document. If you try to copy a signature from one document to a different document, it would be detected as fake. We'll see how that works in a second. So with these digital signatures, what we're trying to do is get authentication and integrity of messages. So we know that the message wasn't, the message came from a particular person and it was not changed before delivery, but we don't care about confidentiality. We're actually talking about public documents. So again, this is not about, this is not really used for, for, for your messages that you send, um, you're sending data back and forth. This is really for communicating um, certain information, like, like what is the public key for a particular website? Um, that you want everyone in the world to know and trust. Okay. So in more detail, a digital signature is a short bit sequence, like maybe um, 512 bits or uh, something like that, generated from a digital document and a private key. And it has the following properties. So it's like a, it's like a hash function. It always, given the same inputs, in other words, the same input document, the same private key will produce the same output. And re relatedly, if the document changes or the key changes, will produce a different output. So, you know, because changing the document produces a different output, that's what I mean when I say the digital signature is different for different documents. Um, the document cannot be signed correctly without having a, the private key. And importantly, the signature can be verified using only the public key. So just like before with encryption, we were keeping our we keep our private keys private. We share our public keys with the world. If everyone has our public key, then they can use that to verify the documents that we sign. Okay, I'll have I'll have some diagrams to show how this works in, in more de works in more details. Right now, I'm just describing it at a high level. This is very closely related to public key encryption. and actually uses uses encryption and decryption to perform the signature and verification, uh, and it uses the same RSA keys. Uh, we can use RSA keys both for encryption and also for digital signatures. All right. And like I said before, if you change, if you have to have a signed document, digitally signed document, and you change the contents, then the signature will no longer be valid. So if you have a copy of someone gives you a document, you can verify that it was, that's correct. But if you try to tamper it, if you try to change what was stated in the document and you give it to someone else, they will be able to, in the verification step, uh, they'll notice that uh, there's a mismatch and that it, it's it's not it's no longer a valid digital signature for that document because the document has changed okay. we would we would actually need to use the private key again which we don't have if we want to change the document and then sign it again okay so let's go through um, the process here I'm going to show the signing and I'm going to show verification signing is on the left hand side so we have a signer that has an RSA private public key pair now the first thing they do is they have some documents. So this data, Meg likes beets, that is a claim. That's the, that's the data, that the, the claim that we want to verify. So we want everyone in the world to know that, um, like this is Meg doing the signing. She wants everyone to know that she likes beets. Uh, I mean, so in practice, again, what we're using these for is to self-identify our public keys so that everyone knows what our correct public key is. But in the example, I'm just using a generic, um, generic kind of claim. All right, so we take our data and we uh, encrypt a hash of the message. So first we hash the, the message. So we take this Meg likes beats, we use a hash function to produce a, a hash of the, of the original data. Now the reason we do this is to take what might be originally a huge document and translate it into something that's kind of small that we can easily um, encrypt. We, we encrypt the hash using our private key and that produces a signature. So the signature is a hash of the data that's encrypted with a private key. 
Now by encrypting it, what that means is that someone can decrypt it and get back the original hash. And in fact, that's what they're going to do to check that the signature is valid. But anyway, so we take that, that signature, which was the encrypted hash, we attach it to the doc, to the original data. We stick our name on there and our public key on there. And those things together form a digitally signed document. So the original data plus the certificate, which is the signature and our public key and our name, that together forms a digitally signed document. All right, so, so basically what we're doing is just adding, adding this uh, encrypted hash of the data and our public key. Now we can give this to anyone who um, knows our public key and uh, they can verify it. So in the verification step, uh, someone gets this document, including the certificate. They want to check that it was true. They want to check to see that this was actually signed by Meg and not by someone else. So they kind of follow the same process. They some of the same process. They take they take the document part, the claim, and they compute a hash of it, right? Just like the signer did. Okay, this is anyone can do this. Use a well-known hash function. There's not, nothing secret about computing the hash of the data. And then they take the signature that was provided and decrypt it. So in other words, they reverse this process that was done before of encryption. Now you can re we can't go in the forward direction. The, the receiver can't go in the forward direction. In other words, the receiver cannot go in this where I'm, this diagonal I'm showing with my mouse from hash to signature. Uh, the receiver can't do that because it doesn't have the private key. But it, given that it already has a signature, it can go in reverse direction using the public key that, that it does have. So it decrypts the signature using the public key and gets a hash. If that hash matches the signature that's on the document, then the signature is valid. All right. Now, if it isn't, then it means the document was changed or some or the, or the signature that was presented was not generated by um, by Meg. Or, or it means both. Uh, certainly, certainly the second, maybe the first. So, one thing to notice here that's kind of maybe is a little confusing is that we're doing encryption using a private key and decryption using a public key. This is actually the reverse of what we did originally. What RSA is really designed for um, is encrypting with public keys so that you can send secret messages that one person can decrypt. We're doing the reverse here, actually. We're doing, we're, we're, we, with signatures, we want one person to be able to encrypt something that everyone else can decrypt. Okay, because uh, RSA public and private keys are both exponents that are interchangeable. If, if, we go, if you go back to the formula we used uh, when discussing RSA, you would see that. They actually can be used in reverse as well. So if you encrypt with a private key, it can be decrypted with a public key. If you encrypt with a public key, it can be decrypted with a private key. The reason we call it private versus public is just that the private key is held by one person, the public key is, is held by everyone. In the case of signatures, we want just the one person to be able to encrypt. So it, so it chooses to use the private key to encrypt, and we want everyone to be able to decrypt. Okay. Yeah, so um, that's how it works. Yeah, I guess I, I answered this question I was going to ask you all. Um, for confidentiality, we encrypt here using the public. We encrypt with... Uh, Sorry, in the previous lecture, we talked about encrypting private messages with public keys, but here we use the private key. Um, the reason for that is that we want everyone to be able to decrypt it uh, for the verification, but we only want one person to be able to do the encryption for the generation. Okay. And they're interchangeable because they're both exponents um, in that same RSA formula that can be swapped. Uh, they can be reversed and get the same number. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about these signatures and what they mean, how we're going to use them. Because there's more than just that, actually. We don't have enough to make uh, internet communication work. We have, to, we have to build more on top of this. This is still just a building block, uh, digital signatures are. OK, so when I download a document with a statement, the statement we're using in the example is Meg Likes Beats. If that document contains a valid digital signature, 
for a particular public key. So in other words, the document, the certificate, the digitally signed document has a document, it has a digital signature, and it has a public key. Okay, if, if I can do a verification and that, like I showed in the previous slide, and the verification checks out correctly, in other words, when I, um, when I decrypt the signature, I get the hash of the data. That means that someone who had access to the private key must have A, seen the document, and B, chosen to run the signing algorithm to compute the corresponding signature. In other words, someone holding that private key pair and the document chose to run the encryption, RSA encryption, to generate the signature, which which I then, which is the thing I decrypted with the public key to, and, and got back the hash that, that matched the hash of the document. We know that only someone holding that particular private key would have any reasonable chance of computing the correct signature for that document and public key pair. So the only thing, the person just gave me, you know, I got the statement, I got some number, and the fact that I got the right number means um, either there was a really, really, really unlikely coincidence, because these signatures are huge, like, you know, think 2 to the 512 or 2 to the 1024, just an astronomically huge number. You can't brute force this to try out every possible uh, digital signature to find one, until you find one that matches. Um, so just knowing what the correct number is that matches this document with a particular public key, it by chance is is totally unlikely. It's not going to happen the, unless the RC algorithm is, is flawed. Um, if we trust the cryptography of a public private key um, encryption. So the only way that number could have been discovered was that someone with the public key ran the encryption algorithm on this document. And because of, and there's no reason, we assume that because uh, the, the holder of the public key, the private key, Meg, ran that encryption algorithm on that data, that they, um, by doing that, they have certified the document. In other words, they agree with the, con with the what's written in the document. They are okay with signing it. Um, so if, if Meg comes back and tells us that she does not like beats, uh, we would not believe her because we have a document saying Meg likes beats that she ran the signature algorithm on with her private key to certify. Okay, so she cannot repudiate that statement. So non-repudiation means that you cannot make a claim, so make a signed claim, and then later claim that you didn't agree with that thing because we know that assuming you're the only person who has your private key, that no one else could have written that claim and signed it except for you. Okay, someone else could have written it, but no one else could have signed it except you. Okay, good. Now, the, the outstanding problem here, though, is we have to know what the correct public key is for the person, okay? This whole logic implied, so that the document had a, a claim, it had a signature, and it had a public key. We did a verification using the public key but we, we actually assumed that ahead of time we knew what the correct public key was for Meg, right? So it seems like we're actually just going in circles and we still have a chicken and egg problem with trust and we need to, we need to um, resolve that somehow. Okay, so the, the way we do this is with transitive trust. Transitive trust is the other big idea here in authentication that lets us eventually get to the point where we can securely communicate with strangers, okay? Now, of course, on the one hand, if, if we just simply knew ahead of time through some through the real world that this was Meg's correct public key, then we would be good to go. We could use this system as much as, much as we wanted. Meg could make a variety of claims over time. As long as those are all signed with her private key, we could, we could trust that. But if we're talking to a new person, we need to somehow verify that public key and transitive trust is gonna be the way we do that. Okay. Okay, this is um, an explanation of what I just said. It, so you can use that when you're reviewing. All right, so digital signatures can provide transitive trust. What what I mean is, um, I'm talking about a situation where we're browsing the web, we're, we're gonna be able to visit thousands of websites over the lifetime of, of your computer, right? So your computer can't come ahead of time with all the public keys for all the different websites you're gonna visit because new websites are generated all the time and there's a lot of them. So it's impractical to have pre-shared keys from all the different websites and other hosts we wanna communicate with. So we're not going to be able to do that. Transitive trust is a way of using a few trusted public keys 
to certify the public keys for the rest of the internet. Okay, so what we do is you start off having a few trusted public keys, which we call root authorities. Okay, so I don't know Meg's public key, but I know like let's say ten people's public keys. We'll see how that actually will be enough if if people can go back to those ten people I trust, and those ten people um, can provide uh, certificates for other claims, including claims of other people's public keys, that will allow people who trust those original 10 to start trusting a larger group of public keys as long as there are those original 10 signed documents uh, signed documents that 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 uh, gave, that, that like listed what the public keys were for this larger group of people. Okay, so Website operators get their uh, public keys. So in particular, we're, what we're talking about here is HTTPS, which is the secure version of HTTP that uses public-private key encryption to, to secure data um, that requires public keys that are certified. Um, so if you're running a website, you generate a public key and some, you somehow get it signed by a certificate authority, which is is um, someone that that you that will be trusted by others. So the certificate authority does some kind of check in the real world or otherwise that the person making asking for a certificate really is the correct domain um, that really does have control of that domain. And uh, then the website advertises a certificate from the trusted party that the proof is that their public key is legit. Okay, I'm going to review this in the next few slides. Okay. But first I'm going to show a little demo in the browser. You can do this yourself using any browser. So I'm going to go to Northwestern's website. And this is using HTTPS because there's a little padlock here, right? And if you look at the URL, it's HTTPS. If you In Chrome, if you click, click the padlock, you get some details. You can look at the certificate. And here, I'm just going to zoom in, you can see that here's a certificate from the Northwestern provided to me when I visited this website. It includes in it um, information about the organization, the domain in particular. The, this domain is uh, has to like match the website I'm visiting. Although um, I guess there's an alternate down here. Yeah, all these DNA, any one of these domain names, it could be the one that I'm using. But there is somewhere here. Yeah, a public key is listed here. Here's the public key for the website. This is what's going to be used for encryption. And there's a signature here from another authority. So Komodo is a certificate authority that signed the public key for Northwestern. And Komodo RSA certification, there actually are three certificates here with three public keys. This first one I'm showing here is a root authority, which is actually stored on my computer ahead of time. This certificate authority signed a certificate listing the public key for this intermediate. That the intermediate signed a certificate for Northwestern, identifying uh, Northwestern's public key for uh, these domains that are listed here. Okay, so again, and I'll and I'll talk more about this uh, in another few examples. Okay, but that was just to show you how you can check it on your computer. So we call this the the public key infrastructure or PKI. This this chain of trust for sharing public keys. PKI creates, distributes, and verifies strangers' claims, and but most importantly, claims about what the public keys are for domains, so that you can make, you can establish encrypted connections to particular websites. Okay. It's a distributed and scalable way to verify public keys. And that's pretty cool, the, the, way, the way it works in, in a distributed way, without any centralized action on the part of um, clients. Okay, so what we're showing here is a customer connecting to a website. This is shopping.com. And ahead, at the beginning of the transaction, this customer has no information whatever about shopping.com. It's never visited the website before. This is, a, let's say it's a new website and you know the computer couldn't possibly have had the public key already like stored on that computer. All right, it's a totally, totally new website one of thousands or millions, millions of websites out there that has a, a, a public key. Somehow this customer wants to communicate securely with shopping.com because it's going to give its credit card number. It's going to put in a password, all kinds of stuff. 
that needs to be protected. It doesn't want that information to go to a man in the middle. Okay, so remember again to prevent that a man in the middle attack, the the client needs to know that the public key it gets in this in this exchange over the internet over many hops, the public key it gets is actually the public key for the endpoint and not the public key for someone in between in the middle. Okay, but it doesn't know what that public key is ahead of time. The way it works is with a chain of trust. Okay, and this diagram in the bottom kind of shows that. So, so the shopping.com website gives two pieces of information, two certificates that I'm showing uh, in, in rectangles here. It gives its own certificate, which lists its domain and its public key. I've abbreviated it for convenience. And that is has a signature on it. This is signed by some intermediate. The intermediate is called WebbyCorp. WebbyCorp has provided its public key and a signature. So WebbyCorp has looked at this document and used its private key to generate this public key, uh, sorry, this uses its private key to generate the signature, 3902, and has given that to shopping.com so that shopping.com can present this to others. And other people, when they see this, they'll know that WebbyCorp has looked at this with this public key, uh, with the private key associated with this public key and signed it, okay? Now, the customer doesn't actually doesn't know anything about WebbyCorp either. <laughs> the customer knows about uh, the customer knows ahead of time about a few root certificates. Those few are not really enough to support validating all the websites on the internet. So a chain of trust is used that involves more than one step. So this WebbyCorp company itself has a certificate that certifies both its uh, trustworthiness for signing websites certificates and also its public key. Okay, so the public key, it, this certificate says it's, that WebbyCorp's public key is 904E whatever. This is the long thing. And that in that whole thing is signed by AAA Corporation with a certain public key. Now AAA Corporation is one of these top level root, root authorities that basically everyone in the world trusts. Okay, so AAA is among one of these very small select companies whose public keys is well known by every browser out there basically, or most every browser. And that means that my computer in particular can look at the intermediate certificate and say, okay, great, let, this, there's a claim that WebbyCorp has a certain public key. The claim is supposed to be, supposedly is, was made, is made by AAA Corp. Well, I know what AAA Corp's public key is. Ahead of time, I had that information. I can check this claim to see, I can basically decrypt the signature on here to see whether it, it returns the hash of this claim. It does, so that tells me as a customer that actually this intermediate certificate is valid in the sense that it was in, in fact signed by AAA Corp. That tells me I should, if I trust AAA Corp, I should trust Webby Corp, at least trust that Webby Corp has this particular public key and has certain um, permissions or like, um, it's trusted to do certain things that are listed on the certificate. And because I trust Webby Corp now, I will trust this server certificate because I you know, the previous certificate told me what the public key I should use for WebbyCorp is. That, in fact, is what's used in the ser server certificate. And in turn, that tells me that the public key for shopping.com is E2131 that's listed here. Okay? Hope you're still with me. So, notice a few things here. This customer, when it visited the website, the only information it got came directly from the server. This one stranger on the internet that's never talked to. It doesn't know if it's talking to a man in the middle or to shopping that the real shopping.com. It just knows it connected to someone who claims to be shopping.com and they have provided information to me. That, that information alone, these certificates, it, um, show a chain of trust that I can verify back to something that I knew ahead of time, which was the public key for a root certificate. And this allows me to actually Trust, the important thing being advertised here is the public key for shopping.com. The combination of shopping.com and this public key. So if my browser has a URL that's shopping.com and some URL after that, uh, I know that the public key I should be using is um, what's listed here. And I'll be able to do that. Okay? That's that's how, how uh, the public key infrastructure works. And that's the biggest remaining piece of uh, the security puzzle 
that you all need to understand as uh, software engineers, I think. But let's talk a little bit more about how this works just to um, solidify this idea. When we get a certificate, so let's imagine that we're operating a website, right? This could be something that you do or already have done. You want clients to be able to connect to it securely with encryption using HTTPS. So you can't just set up a website, you need to also have a valid certificate that tells the world the correct public key for your website. Okay, so to do that, you generate a certificate signing request. So you choose a public key. Of course, you'll keep the private key on your own machine for that uh, secret, but you, you generate a document that has the common name or which is basically the domain name that you are trying to operate, you're claiming to operate along with the public key. And you give this to a certificate authority which is in the previous example, WebbyCorp, that intermediate was a certificate authority. So you give it to WebbyCorp uh, and you ask them to please sign the certificate. Like, please give me a, a intermediate certificate that I can give to everyone else in the world so that they will believe that Northwestern EDU's public key is this number. Now, what do you think the certificate authority would do when they get this claim, when they get this document, this certificate signing request, how do they verify that this is coming from Northwestern.edu and that they should in fact sign this particular combination of domain name and public key? So please stop and think about that. There actually are many ways to do this and many ways are done in practice. Well, what might happen is uh, basically that certificate authority should check something in the real world or, or even on the internet to see whether the request is coming from someone that should be trusted. So for example, there is a who is database. When you when you uh, buy a domain, there's an email address listed for that domain that anyone can find and contact. So you, the certificate authority could email the registrant listed in the who is database and ask them whether in fact this public key that you, you got is the correct one. So it could do it over verification over email. You can look up the phone number of the requester, like for example, on the website for Northwestern.edu, there might be contact information. The per I mean, the certificate authority could call up that phone number and talk to the person on the other end and ask to talk to the IT department and then hopefully get in touch with someone who would be in a position to say, yes, that is the correct public key. Yes, this request should be signed. You could send a letter to the to them, you know, for the same reason. You could visit that, that location. In the, if you knew what Northwestern was, that it was, you know, campus in Evanston, you could visit there and ask them in person. Those are all kind of expensive ways to do it. The, the simplest way or the cheapest way to do it would be um, to do this all in an automated electronic manner. The certificate authority could give a challenge to the requester. So like I say I'm Northwestern and this is my public key. The certificate authority could say in response, okay, f fine, you're claiming that. Let me give you some big random number or do random document if you're really Northwestern, why don't you take this random number and put it on your homepage, or not necessarily on your homepage, but on your on your website in some uh, random subdirectory? So, like, you should have control over the website if you are Northwestern, uh, or you should have control over the DNS records. So, put put this random number on your website or in in a DNS record somewhere, and then tell me when it's done, and I'll check it. So, in other words, I will automatically have a, a web client make a request to the like homepage or whatever URL I asked you to put the random number is in and check that document just to look for the random number. So if, if this is a homepage, for example, you could put it in an HTML comment. You could put a, a random number, right? Now that, that could be, for some websites, that could be like a big ask and, and they might not want to do it. Like if you, if you <laughs> ask, you know, ebay.com or something to change their homepage just to do a certificate signing request they might be like no way like that's it's a big deal for us to to, to deploy new code to production and we're not going to do it for just for this little thing um, but for, for individuals running small websites this is a very um, easy and um, automated way to, to do a verification now once once you the certificate authority does one of these uh, things or something like this It'll be satisfied that the request came from the organization that's being claimed, and then it'll produce the digital signature using its private key to certify the claim in the, in the certificate signing request, and and just send back to the, the original claimer um, the signature that goes along with the certificate signing request, which forms the certificate. And now the requester can turn around and give that to other people to tell them 
hey, um, not only is this my public key, but this other person, the certificate authority, has verified it. And so if you trust that certificate authority, then you should trust my public key. And then in turn, the certificate authority might give you a certificate that 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 has that signs their public key that where, where a root authority signed their public key so that um, you could t you could then turn to people and say okay my public key is signed by some intermediate let's say Webby Corp and Webby Corp's uh, public key is signed by some really trusted root certificate like AAA Corp in that example okay. good so root certificates are things that are pre-installed on on machines in the picture, in the diagram, I showed like four or five. In practice, there might be hundreds. So Mac OS, last time I checked, had 170 root certificates installed, which seems like a lot. Uh, nevertheless, that's that's the number. And they're valid for a long time. So, you know, all these certificates, I, I haven't mentioned it yet, but they have expiration dates on them. Um, and like some of these are good for another, you know, like 20 years or something. Uh, what a root certificate has not just a public key but other information like you know naming what the company is so Thoughty is one of the biggest and like kind of original um, internet security companies so they've been doing this for a long time their uh, public key is listed down here although this is just the prefix for it and yeah there's an expiration date somewhere yeah down here But this certificate itself for uh, for this root is not signed by anyone else. It's actually self-signed, self-issued and self-signed. So there is a signature down here. This signature is signing this data up here with uh, all this data with its own public key. So this signature doesn't really mean anything. There's no reason for us to trust the signature because it's just telling us it's like taking it's telling us the document's telling us what the public key is and it's using that same public key to sign. So we have to have some outside reason to trust this certificate. In the case of this root uh, uh, authority on macOS, somehow Thoughty convinced macOS to include this root certificate. So so you know, some some way in the real world Thoughty has um, communicated to Mac to Apple that uh, this is their public key and that it's trustworthy to be included on the OS. An intermediate certificate, so it's a little confusing because sometimes you'll see the same company uh, listed on both a root certificate and an intermediate certificate. That's okay. A single company can have lots of different certificates for different purposes. Those are just different public keys it's using for different things. But on this intermediate, you'll see... Um, it has the same basic components as the root, like it has a public key listed and an expiration. The expiration is not quite as long, like it's only a few years. But uh, this this has a signature that can be checked because it's signed by someone else. So this is signed by um, the issuer. The issuer is that Thoughty primary root. So this certificate is for Thoughty SHA-255 SSL CA. It's signed by Thoughty primary root CA G3. And this signature down here is done with the roots public key down here. What it's signing is uh... sorry, I got... maybe this is the public key for the uh... for the intermediate. But anyway, um... this is signed by, by the root. And if you have the root certificates, uh... if you have the root authorities public key ahead of time, you can verify this certificate, and therefore you can. Be, uh, you can learn what the correct public key is for this intermediate and also learn that this intermediate is trusted as an intermediate by that root. Okay, so um, you can check any website for a chain of uh, certificates. I showed you this a demo already live, but these are some slides that show another example. Now, one interesting thing about this, I, I showed you a list of 170 like pre-programmed root certificates on macOS. Users can actually edit that list. You can add and remove to that list of root certificates. Now to do that, your computer will warn you, and ask for your root password and stuff like that, but you can definitely do it. By doing that, you're changing which organizations and public keys are trusted to vouch for others 
from your computer's perspective. Now I want you to stop and think what would happen if you removed lots of those root certificates in that list. So a list of 170, if you removed it down, if you cut it in half and went down to like, you know, uh, 85 or so, what would happen to your internet experience? Well, a lot of the websites that you visited and, and other secure connections, uh, SSL, TLS connections you tried to make would stop working because you visit a website, the website tells you um, it's public key, it gives you a certificate, that certificate would end up going down to a route that you didn't trust. So you would reject that connection. Okay, now maybe that's okay if, if the ones you removed are companies that you know are like, had, like recently had a security breach or uh, if you really don't want to trust them, that's fine, that's up to you, but that means that some of the websites you try to visit are um, not going to work. Now, this is interesting also because different different certificate authorities have different costs, like different prices to uh, sign to certify uh, cert public keys. So some websites have like more expensive and like probably more trustworthy uh, certificates, although um, in practice it's not so big a deal. So, so there might actually be some reason why you would, might want to remove some of the low cost like budget um, root certificates because maybe they are the reason that why they're so low cost and budget is because they're not doing a lot of work to verify the things they're signing. But in practice, that's not probably a good idea. Okay, so similarly, what would happen if you added a new root certificate that was a somehow a bad root certificate? So a root certificate for like a malicious party. What would happen if you added that? And, and start using the internet. What would go wrong? Well, if you did that, you your web browser would start trusting public keys that are signed by that root certificate, and those might be invalid public keys. So you, you would become vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks and other kinds of impersonation attacks uh, if the man-in-the-middle is, you know, collaborating with this bad root certificate. So let's go back to the man-in-the-middle attack and see how certificates and the public key infrastructure, transitive trust, how that prevents the man in the middle attack. Okay, so we had a whole round about this whole long description of certificates. Now we're going to see um, how they're how they're used in, the, in this uh, communication flow. Party A still tries to talk to uh, this website G, gadgets.com. It shares its own public key. The man in the middle still tries to do the same hack where it substitutes a different public key, it sends that to gadgets.com. Now gadgets.com actually doesn't care. It doesn't try to verify the client. So the server doesn't notice the attack. Um, certificates are generally only um, had or only used by servers to authenticate themselves. Clients, the way they authenticate is a different way through passwords. Um, so if a client wants to prove who it is, it'll use some pre-shared, some, some thing that both of these knows, like the gadget.com knows what a particular user's password is, and the user should know the same password. Okay. But anyway, so, so far, uh, the man in the middle is succeeding, but then gadgets.com, in the response, it advertises its public key. It also includes a signed certificate. This is the new part. The signed certificate, which proves to uh, A, that this is the correct public key for gadgets.com. When the man in the middle gets that, of course, it's, it will try, it, it needs to change this public key. If it doesn't change this public key, then A will start encrypting in such a way that the man in the middle cannot see uh, the, the data that is, that, that's sent by A. So what the man in the middle tries to do is, is pr substitute a new public key and a new certificate. And this is going to fail because what, what happens is when A gets this response, it will see the certificate is fake or it's missing. So if there was, you know, the man in the middle has only so many things it can do here. It can use the original uh, certificate that was provided by gadgets.com. That will check out as a valid certificate, but it will list a different public key. So that will tell A there's a problem with the public key. Um, it could take that certi signed certificate and change just the public key on it, but leave the signature. Then but when A gets that, it'll do the check and see that the that the certificate is invalid, that's been tampered with. It could substitute it, it could try to substitute a new certificate in here, which names the new public key. But it would not be able to su supply a certificate that was signed by a real legit authority 
because you know it doesn't have the way to prove to anyone else that it is gadgets.com because it's not gadgets.com. So the client, when it notices one of those problems with the certificate, should drop the connection. And that's what prevents the man in the middle attack from happening in practice. Um, yeah, I think I kind of explained already why the certificate has to have one of these problems. But to review, um, you can uh, think about that. Now, we already saw, we mentioned before that adding sketchy root certificates can allow a man in the middle attack. And this can happen, this actually can happen in practice. And sometimes it happens like intentionally. So some corpora corporations and campus networks require machines to install a new root certificate in order to connect to network service. Like if you join the Wi-Fi at Northwestern, I think even, um, you have to have a certain certificate installed to in, in your machine. And I'm not quite sure, but I, I got the impression that maybe that is a root certificate. And if that's misused, that would allow um, the provider of that root certificate to, 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 to act as a man in the middle for all your encrypted connections. One of the reasons this is sometimes done is if, um, yeah, if a corporation wants to like do either like monitoring of, of communication on the network or uh, intrusion detection, like it, it, it could have like a positive um, appearance or intention, I should say, to, to like try to block malicious activity on the network or something. There are also are some legitimate debugging tools that you'd use in special cases. Charles Proxy is a program that you can run on your machine that acts as a man in the middle for HTTP traffic. So this allows you, like, let's say you're you're developing an iOS app or and, and that makes an HTTPS request to a backend service. Um, but you want to be able to like do a Wireshark trace on the API requests that are being made between the iOS client and the server. Normally, if you're using HTTPS, that'll be encrypted. So when you look in Wireshark, you wouldn't be able to see the requests and responses. You just see like garbage data, encrypted data. Uh, with Charles Proxy or similar tools, you, you would you'd actually like be able to look at a man in the middle what, what a man in the middle is seeing when that would be the, the decrypted traffic before it's re-encrypted and sent on to the other side. Now, uh, a man in the middle attack can succeed if, like I said, you, you have convinced the client to install a fake or like a malicious root certificate. So in this case, the man in the middle now um, has convinced client A to install Big Brother's public key. So this is uh, public key B. If the router, uh, the man in the middle, has that B private key, uh, then it can use that to successfully launch the man in the middle attack. So we have the same flow with the first two requests. In the response, gadgets.com provides its public key and its cert certificate that verifies that public key. So that's a legitimate certificate. What the man in the middle does now, when it gets that, it will it'll advertise the wrong public key but it'll be able to provide a certificate now. It'll generate a certificate using Big Brother's private key that's valid from the perspective of A because A has decided to trust Big Brother's public key. Okay. The problem is that the client has chosen to trust a public key whose private key is in the hands of the man in the middle. So the public key infrastructure has failed because the client installed a root certificate from a malicious party who is willing to sign fake certificates. This is, we say this is a fake certificate because in fact, this man in the middle is not gadgets.com. This is just some uh, router uh, in the path. A real, a trusted um, certificate authority should, should do some real verification to before generating these certificates um, to verify that th this uh, public key M is actually the correct one for gadgets.com. In this case, it's not. All right, so that those are the fundamentals of uh, authenticating public keys for establishing encrypted connections with you know new websites on the internet. There's one problem that I want to talk about here that we can address. That is that everything I've said so far works well only if the private keys are kept private. Um, 
if a private key leaks, it's hacked or, or otherwise um, leaks, or you know, you maybe you have an employee that leaves the company and you're not quite sure if you can trust them and they had access to the private keys or something, you might want to be able to revoke certificates. The problem with certificates is that you know, once you write them, you're saying that a certain public key is valid um, and there's an expiration date on them, but that expiration date is like for several years, it could even be tens of years. Because you want it to op you want the system to operate in a distributed way so that you don't have to go back and check the central authorities, the, the certificate authorities every time something happens. You want to be able to have certificates that the servers on the edge can advertise and be trusted. But if a private key is leaked, then you have to you have to be able to revoke certificates. You would like to be able to revoke certificates. Like for example, if someone steals the private key on this McCormick uh, web server, the problem is a trusted certificate authority has already issued a certificate saying that the public key is valid until some time in the future. But you know now we've leaked the private key so that an attacker, you know, a man in the middle, for example, can run a web server impersonating this website using that leaked private key. So the way this is there's no good way to, to, to deal with this. I mean, the best thing to do is just prevent private keys from being hacked and leaked, keep them private. But one thing you can try to, one, one mechanism that's built in to, to tr somewhat help this is certificate revocation lists. This is where you have a list of certificates that have been revoked. So these are not expired. They're, they're supposed, the document, the certificates say they're still valid, but there's another, there's a list somewhere centrally that says actually that those certificates have been revoked. And a certificate can list a web address telling the client where it can check to verify that that certificate has not yet been revoked. Okay, so the client may consult the certificate revocation list before trusting a certificate, but it does not always do this. This double checking is slow because it, it takes a, a distributed um, efficient system and makes it centralized all of a sudden. If all the clients were always consulting the certificate revocation list every time they're doing a connection, you lose the scalability of the public key infrastructure, you lose transitive trust, and um, it slows down. So in practice, losing a private key is not something you can easily uh, um, solve. I mean, you can try to use certificate revocation lists, but some clients are still going to trust that old um, certificate that listed the public key that has that been hacked, you know. In particular, um, if we go back in time a bit, in 2011, there was an, a, a famous hack of Komodo. Komodo was a root certificate authority, um, or still is. In 2011, its certificate signing server was hacked. So this allowed an attacker to generate signatures um, through an API, a networked API, that allowed you know, an attacker to generate new certificates for any website they wanted to, for example, Gmail or, or, or Yahoo Mail uh, or whatever. Um, and that was a big deal. So there were there were a lot of bogus certificates out there that had to be revoked. And at that time, some browsers considered even dropping the Komodo root certificate, which would have um, which would have blocked this attack, but it also would have required all the past customers of this company that got their like legitimate websites have gotten their their certificates signed by Komodo and paid money for that. All those certificates would suddenly stop being trusted by all these browsers, right? So when there's a hack like this, um, the implications are pretty significant for the uh, internet security um, business. Now, another like subtlety I want to mention here is about the hashing. On the right-hand side, we see the diagram for how signing works. The first step here is taking the data and hashing it. So what we're actually signing is not the data itself, but a hash of the data. We did that because RSA only works on small integers, small-ish integers. You know, you can't. If the data could be a huge thing, but we want to have a plain text that's that's less than either 1,024 or 2,048 bits in order for RSA to work. And so we hash first to make the the, the input to RSA reasonably sized. When we're doing this though. Um, you know, hashing maps a large document to a fixed integer range. Uh, by doing this, we're actually signing an infinite set of documents that map to the same hash. This is not the only document that maps to this hash number. So um, we have to be confident that the other documents that correspond to the same hash are random and not useful to attackers. So, 
because like, like this picture shows here, we're actually technically there are an in, there's an infinite set of documents that correspond to this hash that we're signing. So this signature then can be retroactively applied to different documents. If we can somehow figure out what these documents are, and if these documents actually say things that are meaningful, that we that can, are useful to attackers, that would be a bad thing. Just as an example, um, if we're hashing using a 256-bit, hashing to a 256-bit um, number, it takes two to the 256 different values. An HTTPS certificate might be about 2,000 bits long. Like just if we consider all the different uh, things that are listed, like the address and the domain name and the public key and all that stuff, so it's significantly longer. So th there are roughly two to the 2,000 possible certificates if we consider all the different values that can be set in that long document. If we divide the two, we see that when we're signing any one of these certificates, we're actually signing a huge number, two, uh, two to the you know, 1,700 different certificate length documents that have the same hash value. So if you consider signing sign, the case where we sign gadgets.com, this, this certificate, we get this particular hash function. This hash function also corresponds to a different document, which has a different domain name, a different public key. Now I'm showing here kind of random garbage because you expect it to be random garbage in order to be just right to produce the same hash fun, uh, value. That, and that's okay. You know, if we're signing these other documents that have these random garbage values, we don't care. Uh, for another web, valid website like shop.com, we would expect the hash to be totally different and therefore we don't, we don't have to worry about, we, we can't reuse the signature for the first one for this uh, second website. But these hash collisions are in fact, are realities of uh, the scheme that we've chosen. We can't avoid this hash collisions. So the thing we want to do is choose a good hash function, a cryptographic hash function, to minimize the impact of these hash collisions. A cryptographic hash function is a hash function where it's computationally infeasible to map backwards from the hash output to input, so to find x given h of x, or to find two different inputs that map to the same hash value. So if we know that certain hash, it should be difficult to find a different input that maps to that same value. We know that there actually are an infinite set of, of like other values that map to the same hash, but they should be really hard to find because we don't want the attacker to be able to um, reuse signatures by making use of these other documents that map to the same hash value. Um, yeah, so in, term, in hashing, just some terminology, the input is sometimes called the message, the output is sometimes called the message digest. That just means a hash. SHA-1 is an example of a strong cryptographic hash function. MD5 is also sometimes used, but it's less strong. It's a little bit older. And um, yeah. Now, if we uh, see how this, we can see how this plays out in digital signatures. If we, uh, let's just look quickly at what happens if we use a bad hash uh, fun function. If we use SHA a SHA-1 hash, uh, it should be difficult for some, because this is a cryptographically secure hash, a strong cryptographic hash, it's difficult for an attacker to, to construct a second document which can reuse the same signature. But if we use a dumb hash function, it could be easy. So theoretically, we, uh, the sum of all bytes is a hash function we could use. I'm just using this as an example to show like what happened, what goes wrong with a really dumb hash function. The string fun and cats, if we sum up these bytes, like the ASCII uh, representation of all these, the ASCII encoding of all these letters, we get a number, which could we can consider that to be a hash. Uh, the sum of these bytes is the same as the sum of this, of the bytes in this different message, gun and bats. So fun and cats and gun and bats have the same summation of the ASCII encodings of the letters. Because F is um, one less than G, and, and C is one greater than B, and that, that plus one and minus one offset each other, so the sum in the end is the same, okay? So using this really bad hash function, the signature of fun and cats would also be valid for gun and bats. And if we had this document fun and cats, we could, we, and we knew that it was using a bad hash function, we could like look through and figure out, okay, what are all the different like related messages we could t slap the same signature on that others would trust and would cause trouble for everyone, right? We don't want to do that though, right? So we want to use a, um, a good hash function. 
Another place we can use hashes in a really pretty clever way for uh, network security is with hash-based message authentication codes, HMAX. And this is a pretty easy uh, concept to understand. I just have one slide on it. And this is an alternative to certificates for authenticating public messages. Public key cryptography, we've seen how that can be used with digital signatures to um, produce a signature that others can, can verify to, to, to see that a message was actually generated by a certain person. But this public key cryptography, this RSA modular exponentiation with huge integers, that's computationally expensive. We can actually use hashes to more efficiently authenticate public messages, for, but with certain restrictions. So we introduce a new requirement. If we're willing to uh, have a shared secret that's shared by the sender and receiver, that, I'm going to represent that with a little key here, a shared secret. And we take a message that we want to transmit, we append to it the key at the end and hash that. The hash is now something we call a message authentication code. And we send that along with the message. And this message is sent in plain text. So every, anyone can see this message. Anyone can see the message authentication code. I'm not sharing the secret uh, key, but I'm sharing the, the hash of the message plus the secret. And if, the, if a receiver gets this message and, and Mac, it, if it has a copy of the shared uh, secret, it can run the same uh, computation to compute the correct Mac. And if that matches what was received, then it knows that whoever sent this message that included the correct Mac must have had the correct shared secret. Okay, So this is a little um, clever way to prove that you generated a message without um, using public key cryptography. But again, it does require a shared secret. Okay, You, you could have alternatively encrypted the whole message with AES, like encrypted the data in such a way that it could only be decrypted on the other side, but um, that that is actually slower than just doing a SHA-1 hash. And what we're really talking about here are cases when we want third parties to see the message. We don't care about encrypting the whole thing. We just want someone at the other end to be able to efficiently and quickly verify one particular person on the other end, the, the intended receiver, to verify that it was the message was generated by the uh, other party who has the shared secret. This is used, uh, I've seen this used to authenticate API calls, like in particular the Amazon Web Services REST API uses hash-based Max instead of including a password or secret key directly in the requests. So the downside of that is that if someone sees the message, they see your secret and they can use it in the future. Including an HMAC as an indirect way to include something that doesn't, it's not the secret itself, but something that only can be generated from the secret. So that, um, allows you to authenticate your API calls without revealing your secret. Okay. So all the things I talked about in the last, uh, this lecture and the first half of the last lecture are used, are implemented in TLS, the transport security layer uh, in HTTPS. So this is a layer that actually fits between TCP and HTTP or really, it doesn't have to be HTTP, but with HTTPS, it's, it's HTTP that's on top. <clears throat> this is the real-world world implementation of public key encryption and, and authentication that you use when you whenever you use a web browser. Okay, so this allows a TCP socket to be encrypted, basically. And so the, the, the data that's sent, this payload that's sent inside of a TLS record is encrypted and authenticated. Excuse me. Okay. So, if, for example, this could be very often would be an HTML document. If you, know, if you fetch a web page, it's transmitted in an encrypted manner back to you inside of a TLS record. In order for TLS to work, there's an additional handshake that's added after the TCP handshake. So, this orange set of messages involves uh, choosing what, encry what exact encryption algorithms you're going to use. So, like, are you going to use, for example, RSA or ECC? What size keys are you going to use? Are you going to use AES or something else? What size keys are you going to use? Um, to, you share the keys by um, encrypting. You choose four different symmetric keys and share those within a public key exchange like I showed earlier. And there are other random values that are used by the encryption, which I haven't talked about, like an initialization vectors required by AES. And uh, there's a nonce, which we'll talk about later. Um, 
so yeah, there's, but basically there's an initial handshake after the TCP handshake for setting up the, the keys that both sides need to do encrypted communication and also to exchange um, certificates if you to if you're if one side is verifying the identity of the other. So there's one more kind of attack I want to talk about before we end this lecture, and those are replay attacks. In internet security, you always have to think of clever things, and there things coming up all the time. These these replay attacks are, are these are kind of clever attacks. Um, so far, we've introduced ways to prevent attackers from decrypting packets. We've prevented um, man-in-the-middle attacks. But the one thing we have not prevented is a replay attack. This is where the attacker gets a message that you've encrypted and uh, delivers it multiple times. And the receiver is still going to think it's valid because it decrypts just fine. And the attacker doesn't know what it's doing in a sense, but it's able to, ha to uh, potentially repeat an action that the client doesn't want repeated. So how can you protect against a packet replay attack inside of, let's say, a TLS connection? you have any ideas for that? You want to prevent an attacker, a man in the middle, from sending a message multiple times and having the client think, having the client like act multiple times, having the application uh, receive multiple copies of the same data. Well, what you can do is introduce sequence numbers. Remember, with TCP, we might retransmit messages, and they could be they could be dropped and, and, and retransmitted. And sometimes you trans we, you retransmit unnecessarily, and the receiver gets things multiple times. The TCP implementation actually uses sequence numbers to um, prevent that repetition. TLS has to do the same thing, or it can do the same thing. TLS records can include its own sequence numbers to um, cause replayed packets to be dropped. Now, you actually need a different set of sequence numbers because the TCP sequence numbers could be changed. The man in the middle could actually, the man in the middle can see the TCP header, so the, TC, the man in the middle could inc increment the TCP sequence numbers and have the same, but have repeated uh, encrypted data inside. The key thing about these new sequence numbers is that they are inside the encrypted data that the man in the middle can't modify. Okay. Um, Actually, this next thing is coming in another slide. So another kind of attack is a, a full connection replay attack. So in this case, what we're, we have a man in the middle that is not, it, it, it's not, you know, advertising different public keys, but it's, it's just observing everything happening on the, on the connection. So here we have a client A connecting to server G, does the handshake, um, and then the request it sends is actually an e-commerce thing. So it's asking to buy 10 widgets from the website. And it encrypts it and sends the data. The server gets it and, and, and fulfills the order, says, OK, your order has been shipped. Okay. This whole sequence of data exchange can be observed by the man in the middle. The man in the middle doesn't really know what's happening, but it sees a valid exchange. It never sees the private keys, but it sees the data that's exchanged. What the man in the middle can do is now, after that happens, it can come back, reconnect to G. It doesn't know what those previous messages said, but it can blindly repeat them inside of a new TCP connection and cause trouble. So it, it replays the same messages. It, it advertises the old client's public key. doesn't matter. Um, sorry. And it replays the encrypted messages it observed before. Again, it doesn't know what this message said. But when the receiver gets it, it'll be able to decrypt it. And in, in this particular case, it has the contents were an order that was placed. And the server uh, confirms it. And when it does this, you know, it, it may actually be causing the customer to pay for an additional order. So the, again, the, the man in the middle doesn't know what happened. It just hopes that <laughs> it was, did something bad and it might try it all over again, right? It just repeats this process over and over again. And by doing replaying this whole connection, um, causes that in this example that client to like buy the same thing lots of times okay that's bad so we can prevent this i guess i wanted to ask you how to prevent it but the the way to prevent this is to add a nonce a nonce is a one-time use random number that has to be repeated so what the server does now in every new connection, it includes a nonce. So 
when A asks to talk securely, it includes a random number that has to be repeated by the client. Now last time the client made the connection, a different random nonce was included. So the second purple message sent by the man in the middle has a request, it has a correctly encrypted um, message that has uh, an order for 10 widgets, but it also has a repetition of the old nonce. So it says the nonce is 7344, which is not the same nonce that was advertised by the server. So in this case, what we, the server is able to um, force, but basically what the nonce does is it forces every connection to be have a random component that's different each time. That's the nonce. That has to be repeated by the client. And that prevents a whole connection from being replayed and accepted by the server because a server will never will always react slightly differently, at least by injecting this random number at the beginning. And it'll drop this this request. Cool. Okay. So we talked about authentication today. I want to at a high level have you take away some lesson a couple of lessons from this uh, this discussion of authentication. So first of all, secure communication involves a ton of considerations. A lot of the attacks you'll see that are out there that are possible are really clever and hard to think of. So on the one hand, you can pretty easily understand what the encryption primitives are. Like, um, yeah, even if you're like a, a, a number theorist, you know enough number theory, you understand how RSA works. Um, that itself doesn't mean that you can easily solve network security. Like you have to consider all these weird, uh, clever attacks like with, with replays and padding and other stuff. Uh, so you have to use these encryption primitives really carefully. Um, so for that reason, I would never suggest that you build your own encryption scheme from scratch. You should just use the latest version of TLS that's, that's out there. You also, um, you do have to know certain things as an application developer, even if you're not building your own encryption stuff, um, you have to handle, you have to be able to manage public keys usually. So in doing that, you have, you, one thing that you absolutely need to understand is that your private keys need to be kept safe. You also need to understand that if you get messages that tell you that the server you're connecting to is advertising a certificate that's not verified, what that means, what that means is that there could be a man in the middle that's attacking. Um, authentication is not a fully solved problem. The public key infrastructure has some drawbacks, like um, if a private key is leaked, that that um, compromises the whole system. Okay. So what we talked about today was authentication. Digital certificates were the main solution to this problem. They allow uh, the public key infrastructure or PKI to work. Uh, PKI conveys transitive trust. Uh, which relies on trusted root authorities that are known ahead of time. A malicious or hacked root authority breaks the public key infrastructure because a man in the middle with a root authority's private key can forge arbitrary certificates. But the whole point of this was to prevent a man in the middle attack. And in normal operation, uh, digitally signed certificates do prevent man in the middle attacks. Cryptographic hashes are functions that are irreversible and unpredictable. They're used to create a small summary of a document that can be signed with, for example, RSA. These are also used in the message authentication codes uh, that I mentioned that are, are allow a verifier, allow the sender to verify a message um, if they if both the sender and receiver have the same uh, shared secret. TLS or transport layer security is used to encrypt TCP streams. This is used in HTTPS traffic. The details are kind of complicated and I didn't really go into them because there are many different kinds of subtle attacks that need to be blocked. Like for example, I mentioned that there are four different keys that are used. Um, there's not just one shared uh, symmetric key, there are four different ones. Uh, and, you, and the reason for that is to prevent uh, a variety of different subtle attacks. TLS introduces an additional handshake which adds more latency to your connection setup, even on top of TCP. We'll see later on that HTTP3 or quick solve this problem by doing um, a single handshake for both of those things. All right, um, that's, that's it for security. And uh, I hope you find that useful.